Okay, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Um, I think somebody has entered the waiting yeah, room. Yeah, I'll take care of those. Oh, okay. Um, and I, I don't know if it, you've muted everybody, but I just want to reiterate from last week that anybody who wants to, uh, I don't necessarily want to reserve questions for the end because uh, if you if there's anything that's unclear or you have a question or a comment, feel free to um, to jump in. Uh, I don't I don't I, I invite that. Um, so you said there were one person that didn't come. So last last week I'm going to pick up where I left off last week, basically um, which was an introduction to this material, these sermons that were given in the Warsaw Ghetto between, uh, from the time <clears throat> that the Nazis invaded Poland in September of 1939 to uh, close to the end of July, 1942. So almost, um, um, you know, almost three years um, and they abruptly end, uh, and I'll explain why they end then in July of 1942. Um, and uh, they were buried, I'll just go over it quickly, it's a fascinating story, buried with this uh, collection of material called the Oinig Shabbos Archives. Um, and so um, I talked about how they got to us, um, and um, we got to um, the title uh, of the work, and so I'm going to pick up from there. And uh, today I'm going to try and actually get into some more of the actual sermons. Um, obviously can't do all the sermons, but some more of the sermons at critical junctures um, in that period. So uh, what, is, what is important from a historical point of view is that we can date every single one of these sermons. That is, we know the exact Shabbat they were given on, um, the year, we know the holiday, if he gave, he gave it on certain holidays, Passover of 1942, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, that's one. The second one, which I think is even more important, because we have lots of historical material that already tells us what's going on in the ghetto. So we have lots of material from these archives that were buried, that I talked about last week, the Oinig Shabbos archives, diaries and historians reporting daily on uh, the situation and the circumstances as they developed in the Warsaw Ghetto. We have other diaries as well. I'll, I'll point out one or two. Uh, for instance, most importantly, we have a diary from the head of the Jewish Council, who was the head of the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, called Adam. His name was Adam Chernyakov. Um, I may talk a little bit about him uh, later on. So, more importantly than historical value is the. I think the theological, philosophical value of these sermons, uh, because it is, uh, and I, I, I made this statement last week, and I, uh, I hold by it, the, the only one we have of somebody, the only one, remember that, the only one we have of a rabbinic figure who is struggling with these, these deteriorating circumstances in the pit of hell, um, even worse, um, from day to day, and struggling with his faith, struggling to preserve his community's faith. At the same time, it's not just faith, it's struggling to preserve them, uh, their, their spiritually and psychologically, uh, mentally, all this goes together. Um, so it is really, really important, uh, certainly for um, Jewish theology and Jewish religious responses to the ultimate catastrophe that has occurred in Jewish history. Perhaps the ultimate catastrophe that has happened in civilized history altogether. Um, so so that's, that's what's even more important from my point of view um, it, than the historical value of it, which is also very important. And so, um, so I'm going to I'm going to share my screen with you now and go to the slides um, and continue with the slides from where I left off. So if I can. OK, so uh, I hope you can all see that now. Um, if you don't, definitely let me know. So um, if I can hold on a second. Um, 
just uh, one second. I'm just going to. Um, oh dear. Stop sharing for a second. And um, is there some way I can kind of block the because um, it's taking up my screen, the, the pictures of people coming in? Does anybody know? No, you, can, you can you um, can when you're in screen share. Um, there's on the top of the pictures. There's like a, a go into screen share. It's easier once you see it. Oh, yeah. Hi, Rabbi Friedman Cole. How are you? <laughs> um, okay. Fortunately, so. also go study with David Novak tonight. Oh, okay. Not unfortunate, but <laughs> okay. I'm Give him my regards. A half hour. Okay. I, so you'll see above all the pictures, there's a, a, a grid and then like two horizontal bars above each other, et cetera, et cetera. I'm at, at the top of the people's, of where, of where all the people are. Oh yeah, right. On right, the left right. of it is a s single horizontal right. line. Okay, gotcha. Press that. I gotcha. Okay. So um, I ended off, and I'll just start off from there. I ended off last week with this slide which is the title that he gave to his sermons, which is not really a title. It's a kind of a non-titled title. Um, the title that has been given it, some of you may be familiar with it. It was known until recently as the Esh Kodesh, the holy or sacred fire, which is the name that he didn't give, but the name that his, uh, that Hasidic part of the family that ended up in Israel, a fascinating uh, topic on its own, uh, they published it under that name. But I think it's it's really important to understand the name that he gave for the reasons that uh, that za'am, that word, which means rage, um, wrath, uh, stands for two things, which I think both inform the all the sermons. One is that, uh, and I, I had this uh, just to recap, this verse from Lamentations, which has za'am, where God um, God uh, lets his za'am, his wrath, um, go you know uh, go down onto the population, and that uh, the the sense of it is it it's indiscriminate, that it causes indiscriminate destruction, whether uh, priest and king alike. So that's that's what he sees in the ghetto. And the other one is that um, Za'am in the context of where God doesn't find anyone. He wants to release his rage, but he also wants somebody to stand in the defense of those who the rage will assault. And that, that uh, person is one who stands in the breach. And so I think both those senses are the senses that kind of cloud all these sermons. That is, he is the one that is standing or attempts to stand in the breach to prevent this indiscriminate destruction that of course he believes uh, is coming from God as all things in his worldview would come from God. So that's where I left off uh, uh, just to recap. And so I'll go to the next slide. Um, I've done some uh, study of his pre-war um, writings and I talked about that last week where he was most known and the work that he published prior to the war was a work on pedagogy called Chovat HaTalmidim, the obligations of the students. And uh, there's another one called Hachsharat Av HaAvrichim, that is preparing young students or preparing young people um, for, uh, for their spiritual future. And so in there, he has another sense of Za'am, which is very interesting. And this is what he says. So um, he, he proposes a number of spiritual exercises. One of those exercises is contemplating one's day of death. And so he says, imagine a terminally ill person caught in the throes of intense pain, so unbearable as if his entire body is disintegrating to the point of feeling swallowed by the grave. So literally imagine that one is literally on uh, you know, death's edge. And then the, this is what he says, the instruments of rage, of za'am, that same word, have been sent from heaven to dismantle his body and consume him, ending in the grave. As the vitality of every limb drains away, the shekhinah, the divine presence, 
stands over him, presenting the opportunity of cleaving to the divine presence. So what he means here is a spiritual exercise really to somehow minimize, uh, it's kind of a, a contemplative exercise. It doesn't mean this literally, uh, but he means in your mind to minimize your physical existence as far as possible and the furthest possible point of minimization would be literally standing at death's door. And at that point, you allow, and this, this draws on uh, theology in Hasidut, longstanding theology in Hasidut, uh, that requires a minimization of the self in order to let in the divine presence. So this is a spiritual exercise that he, um, that he proposed in good times, I'll put those in brackets. There were never really good times for Jews. Not, uh, it wasn't like before the war, uh, things were great. Um, and things were pretty bad even before the war in terms of poverty, in terms of uh, discrimination. Uh, but let's say, relatively speaking, in normal times, uh, this, is, this is what he suggested. So what, what I think is going on is that, and, and one of the reasons he may have called it this, um, the sermons given during the years of za'am, of rage, is because now he's actually facing this kind of what he proposed before as a spiritual exercise, He's actually facing it in real time. That is, people are actually don't have to contemplate this. They're actually experiencing this kind of za'am, being, meaning being their bodies being dismantled, consumed, close to the grave. Uh, you know, people are, are, are dying all over the place. The death, the, the, the death rate, the mortality rate is very high. People are dying of starvation of disease. Um, and so this kind of zam that was only a spiritual exercise before is a reality, is a physical reality. So I think those are the senses, those three senses, which are important to understanding the sermons. Uh, again, e every single one um, deals with suffering. Every single one, every single sermon deals with suffering and coping with suffering, coping spiritually, coping uh, and coping psychologically, mentally. So those are those are the senses that I, that I think uh, he means the title to convey. This is a, a, a page from the original manuscript. Um, I showed you a letter before. Um, as you can see, the reason I'm showing this is um, it is extremely difficult to make out for a number of reasons. One is the uh, handwriting is very difficult. Uh, I'm pretty adept at reading um, you know, Hebrew um, uh, books and Hebrew manuscripts. I, it's very difficult for me, but on compounded, compounding the difficulty is, do you, if you, you can see, you can make this out, there's all kinds of glosses on the sides, crossing outs, it's almost like if you look at this page and every page is like this, you can feel the fury, you can feel the anxiety. Uh, he's crossing out, he's putting notes on the side. So um, the difficulty that kind of um, um, makes the historical sequence a little bit more complex is that though you can date all the sermons, right, uh, in a chronological order, the editing of those sermons took place after the sermons were being given and onward after the sermons end for about six months afterwards. So he's continuing to work and edit the sermons that he delivered orally and editing them, actually crossing out things that he said before. Um, he may have written them down perhaps some of them immediately after the sermons, and now he's going back to them, rethinking them, crossing out things that perhaps no longer sound quite right because the situation has changed. So when the sermons are published, um, what, what you get is not a straight historical uh, chronology because you have things in the sermons that have been revised at a later date. So he may go back, he may be sitting 
in uh, September of 1942 and going back to a sermon in 1941 and saying that's not quite right. What I said there was right at the time perhaps, or maybe not right at all, considering what we've gone through since then. I've changed my mind, which is, which is quite fascinating about this. Um, and what makes this more authentic, I would say, than any other kind of treatise that you would find of somebody re writing something objectively, um, some, some rabbinic treatise, let's say, dealing with suffering. Very, very different kind of manuscript. Again, if there's any questions, you know, feel free to, uh, to jump in. So I, I just want to show you, I was actually there, I think I mentioned this last um, week, and the manuscript, as I said, is, is preserved in Poland, in Warsaw, in the Jewish Histor Historical Archives, the very building that the head of all those archives that were retrieved from underground uh, worked in before the war as a historian, Emanuel Ringelblum, that's still there. It's now, it's now really taken care of by largely um, Polish non-Jewish historians that are specialists in Jewish history. There's even one guy I met there, um, a, a Polish non-Jew, who is a very prominent scholar of Hasidut. Um, and so uh, it's being well taken care of, but it, that's a fascinating story on its own. And here's the actual manuscript that they brought up. As you can see, uh, the person is holding it with, with their gloves. They take very good care of it, uh, temperature controlled, all that, all that stuff. But you can see there again in this page, as I said with the other page that I showed you, the glosses on the side, there's crossing, crossings out. Um, it, just, just looking at the page gives you a sense of um, anxiety, right? Um, also of, of someone who knows that he has not that much time left and he's trying to work furiously to complete this manuscript and get it right. Even though he knows that this may not get anywhere, he knows by this time probably that he's editing the manuscript that there's no longer a community uh, to give sermons to. So here's uh, just a picture of the way the, um, uh, the uh, original uh, sermons were published under this name, Eish Kodesh, from the, the rabbi, the Rebbe of Piasetzna. And most recently, in the last few years, we have been blessed by a, another great scholar, a young uh, scholar of Hasidut, who republished the material because he actually went there uh, looked at the material, um, republished the manuscript from looking at the actual material because the, this one was done from a facsimile, a photocopy. Um, and uh, he deciphered many, many things that needed to be corrected, especially in light of all the, all the glosses and all the error, all the uh, crossings out. So this is the new one. Anybody who, uh, and this is in Hebrew, uh, unfortunately, um, this is only in Hebrew. There is a translation of this in English. Um, I can tell people, uh, you know, what that is uh, later in the in the lecture. But this is wonderful. Uh, it's two volumes. Actually, one volume is a photocopy of the actual manuscript, so you can actually see the whole the whole manuscript. And this is the edited published version that's easy to read with uh, excellent notes. And there's of course a picture of the milk can that contained. Uh, this and other material from those Oinik Shabbos archives. So I want to go uh, into the sermons now, uh, get a little bit into the kishkes um, of the sermons, now that we have the background, the framework, uh, a bit about who this man was, um, what his intentions were in um, delivering these sermons, and, and more importantly, in transcribing them. <clears throat> and one of the things I, I said before was his, the tremendous uh, honesty that just um, kind of just uh, really emerges out of this uh, text. Um, it, this isn't, uh, again, uh, somebody who's writing a treatise from afar, who's writing a treatise, you know, objectively. He's experiencing things from day to day and things are changing. 
So for, here's one that I think is, a, is one of the most important um, retractions, let's say, um, that he makes when he goes back to a sermon. Here's the original sermon that he gave. This is a sermon, again, the date, Hanukkah, we know, December of 1941. And this is what he says. It is true that trials such as we are enduring now come only once every few centuries. In any case, how can they help us understand the current acts of God? Well, when one learns a verse, a Talmud, Talmud or Midrash, and hears of the suffering of Jews from earlier times, how did faith remain intact? Yet nowadays faith is weakened. So what he's saying is, don't lose faith. Look at my bread and butter, right? That which I am like live through daily, which is the rabbinic tradition and the rabbinic textual tradition that I, meaning not me, but I'm talking in, with the Rebbe's mouth, that the Rebbe lives and breathes. So meaning Bible, but that's only grade one, right? Verse for a, rab a rabbinic master, Talmud, Midrash, and then of course, uh, everything on top of that, uh, which would include his tradition of Hasidic theology. That is, you need to look at that and you'll know how to, how to cope with suffering and your faith won't be weakened because they went through, through similar experiences. The people who say that trials such as these, and obviously there are those that he knows of that have maybe confronted him with this, never existed in Jewish history, are in error. That is, this is not unprecedented. This is not unique, what we're going through. We've been through this before. And then the classic models of Jewish suffering that um, are held as the classic models in the rabbinic tradition, the destruction of the temple or both temples and the fall of Betar, right? Meaning that ultimate battle in, one, in, in the second century, in the first half of the second century, um, so um, uh, where that, that really signified uh, total destruction. That is, there may have been some hope after the second temple was destroyed in 69, 70 CE, but when Betar happens, um, then there's no more hope of ever um, really um, reestablishing Jewish sovereignty or escaping uh, Roman oppression. And of course, uh, sovereignty was not established until, thank God, the 20th century and, uh, and the state of Israel. So this is the sermon that he gave in Hanukkah of 1941. Here's a corrective note. So as I told you before, uh, he's making corrections. He goes back to this sermon at the end of 1942. Okay, so the sermons, he stopped giving sermons because the situation has deteriorated, deportations, the mass deportations um, from the Warsaw Ghetto to the um, killing camps um, begin in July of 1942, and that's precisely when the sermons end. So there's no longer really a community to give them to, but he continues, he survives the deportations, and he continues to revise them. He goes back to that sermon, and he adds a corrective note. And so listen to this note. The monstrous torments, uh, I could read it in Hebrew, but like just because there are some words here that are important. Okay. The monstrous torments, the terrible and freakish deaths, which the malevolent murderers invented against us, the house of Israel. From that point on, meaning from the middle of 1942, um, according to my knowledge, and this is important why I've highlighted it, of rabbinic literature and Jewish history in general, there has never been anything like them. Now, this is, this is really fascinating because he retracts what he said. What he said previously, uh, a, a year or so previously, a year and a half previously, 
was that people who say that this is unprecedented don't say that because we have lots of precedents. This falls in line with those other precedents. People who say we have no way to cope with this don't say that because the rabbis have dealt with those catastrophes like the destruction of the temple. He's retracting both of those statements. Right? He's saying at this point in time, what he's gone through and what his community has gone through, so this is what I mean by, by, by the two dimensions of this. According to my knowledge of rabbinic literature and Jewish history, those are two things. Meaning, within Jewish history, the destruction of the temple doesn't cut it, right? It means that those things, those catastrophes that happened before, this surpasses that. And then what he means by this perhaps is even more startling and more, um, more depressing for somebody like this Rebbe, to my knowledge of rabbinic literature. That is the way the rabbis constructed history. The way the rabbis, not real history, not the way scholars of history or real historians would record history, but the way the rabbis constructed history, the way the rabbis dealt with catastrophes, using those models of the destruction of the temple, and they meant that construction of history as their legacy for future generations of Jews, when catastrophe happens or suffering, or as the title of the lectures, these lectures are called diversity. I think diversity doesn't exactly capture the Warsaw Ghetto, but the rabbis knew that we're leaving this for posterity, draw on these writings, because we've experienced the ultimate in, in suffering with the destruction of the temple, the loss of sovereignty, slavery, all the things that go along with oppression, the Rebbe is, has now admitted that that was not, it may have been correct, maybe, I don't even know if he's saying that, but that was not right. Now, this is a tremendous uh, act of um, uh, courage, I think. Again, this isn't armed resistance, but this is resistance. I made talked about this last week, resistance as powerful as armed uprising, as the uh, revolt that most people um, are familiar with when you say the Warsaw Ghetto, far less people are familiar with this and those archives from the Einik Shabbos, equally as powerful. From a historical point of view, I would say more powerful because this actually left us uh, thousands, this archive left us these sermons and thousands of pages of the way people recorded these events. So this is a, 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 a very a, a, an, an unparalleled, I think, act of rabbinic courage to admit this kind of thing. Because what he's saying is really that um, I have no tools of my trade left to deal with what's happening. If, if this is gone, because this is the way I've always confronted everything in life, I've always confronted everything in life, whether it be a simcha or the opposite, or teaching my students, or family life, or community life, or judging, uh, or giving halachic opinions. This is what I draw on. So imagine, this is his life's blood. He sees everything. He sees the world through the lens of rabbinic literature. If, he's, uh, if this is removed from him, then that is a pretty drastic um, event, pretty catastrophic uh, in this Rebbe's life. And so this is this what I, this this particular corrective note I find um, really striking. Um, and by the way, when he leaves these corrections, they're marked off with different kinds of marks, like an asterisk or a dash or a star or something like that. And he has a kind of a glossary uh, telling whoever will find this, that when you find this kind of a corrective note and you see this particular sign, this particular asterisk, it means change, um, just uh, uh, erase what was there originally and insert what I, what I have corrected. 
But this, the mark that he had for this is a kind of mark where he says, keep my original and keep the correction so that people can see my retraction. Quite extraordinary. Um, and and I, like I said, quite courageous for a rabbinic master such as this Rebbe um, to, to uh, actually put this explicitly, insert this explicitly in, in a manuscript and retain it as something that everybody in po for posterity, if there is a posterity, um, he wasn't quite sure of that either, um, should know about it. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, draw a parallel uh, between, um, he, actually my teacher uh, when I started undergrad uh, at University of Toronto, the great Emil Fackenheim. Uh, some of you may know that name. Uh, I consider him uh, one of the greatest, perhaps the greatest uh, philosopher of uh, the Holocaust. That is one who confronts the Holocaust with the uh, impeccable philosophical credentials, credentials and, and not approaching it uh, somewhat theologically, but philosophical theology. Um, and so in one of his later works in 1986, What is Judaism? He did not know about the Rebbe or the writings before. Um, and he, he was um, exposed to the Rebbe's writings by that scholar I told you about last week that uh, brought these writings to the English speaking world. And he says more than 40 years later when all is known what Rabbi Shapiro said in 1942 is still widely denied. He's talking about that note. Though the worst was unknown to him then the rabbi did not shrink from the terrible truth, meaning that there was even worse to come, of course. Uh, he hadn't experienced the concentration camp yet, uh, and he ultimately was deported um, to a, a center where there was a mass execution. Now, it's no wonder that Fackenheim was drawn to this particular note, because he's most famous for uh, statements that he made about the Holocaust as being a rupture within Western civilization, what he called a caesura, a kind of break, um, an actual break um, with uh, something that is unparalleled, unprecedented. So he's drawn to uh, this rabbi, uh, this Rebbe's corrective note, because that's exactly what he was saying from a philosophical point of view which made the Holocaust so difficult for a philosopher to deal with was precisely what made the Holocaust so difficult for a rabbinic master to deal with. Now, um, I wanna take you to, um, again, one of the more extraordinary sermons. Um, and this was given actually right at the beginning. So uh, what you have to uh, understand also is what makes this, these sermons particularly authentic is that because it's not a treatise um, being written from outside or objectively with a problem, because it's um, sermons and feelings and emotions that are addressing uh, uh, the situation in real time, don't look for consistency in the, these sermons. He fluctuates. Sometimes he'll uh, say something like um, what he said in that original sermon of Hanukkah. Sometimes he sa he'll say something like, this is happening because of our sins. And then he'll, he'll, he'll retract that later on. Um, so uh, what makes it authentic from an existential point of view is precisely that feature of it, is that this is a man who's struggling from week to week, from month to month, and so don't expect consistency, but expect a real struggle in real time. And so this is something that is extremely, I would say, radical, that uh, launches almost launches the sermons right off the bat. So this is a sermon. He gave one sermon before on Yom Kippur, 
1939. So in September, beginning of September 1939, the Nazis invade Poland, are bombing. And there's um, a number of weeks of silence, about five weeks of silence between the first sermon that he gives and this sermon, which is on Chaye Sarah, which records the death of Sarah. Now, before I uh, get into this particular sermon, I may not even have that much time to get into some of the other ones I have prepared, but if this is the only one uh, we get through, then, uh, then that's fine too. Um, the background to this and the reason there were no sermons from Yom Kippur until uh, Chaye Sarah, meaning not on Sukkot, um, is that the, in the initial bombings, uh, and I mentioned this last time, he, his only son was killed. His mother died. His sister-in-law, who had been visiting from Israel, uh, was there, was killed. And his daughter-in-law were killed, all in this one bombing. And so this is the first sermon he gives after his son, in particular, dies, because that's particularly relevant to this sermon. So some of you might know um, that Chai Sarah, or the death of Sarah, that portion of the week that's read, um, that begins with the death of Sarah, is recorded in the Bible chronologically immediately after the Akedah, the narrative, the episode of the binding of Isaac. And of course, um, the rabbis uh, find meaning uh, in everything, including chronology. And so they find uh, much meaning in the link between events, right? Why, why is this list? Why is this in the particular? And this is a question they'll ask all the time. Why is the death of Sarah recorded right after the Akedah? And most famously, it's a famous midrash. Uh, some of you might know it is that Sarah dies as a result of the Akedah. That is, it's a logical consequence of the Akedah because news comes to her that Abraham has gone out to slaughter their son. This is Sarah's son, Isaac. And before she hears the uh, conclusion to that, she dies. She dies. Now, um, that's what this sermon is based on. And so um, here's what he says. And remember, this is the link between a woman who believes that she's lost her son. The Rebbe is giving this sermon after he has actually lost his son. Even though our mother Sarah took the binding of Isaac so much to heart that her soul fled from her, she died for the good of the Jewish people. She gave up her life in order to show God that Israel cannot bear too much suffering. Even though a person with the mercy of God may survive his suffering, elements of his strength, his mind, and his spirit are broken and lost to him. Now, this is, this is really, really striking. I'm going to just read the second part of it. This explains the meaning of the words, these were the years of the life of Sarah. That is, she lived for, and this is the way the verse um, records it. She lived for 100 years and 20 years and seven years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. So, of course, since every uh, word in the Torah means something, the rabbis, um, and this is um, cited by Rashi, the famous um, interpreter, probably the most famous interpreter of the Hebrew Bible. Why does it repeat years? Why does it say 100 years, 20 years, seven years? Why, why not just say she lived 127 years? So the famous um, Midrash that Rashi draws on is that it tells you that each component of her life was equal to the other component. Uh, that is, when she was 100 years old, for instance, she was equal to the um, age of seven in terms of sin. She was innocent, as innocent at, a, at 100 as she was at seven. The Rebbe adds his own. So he, this is adding to 
the rabbinic literature that he was talking about that addresses catastrophe. Uh, this is what I would consider adding to the tradition in how to, how to cope. Uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that this is an answer, but it adds, these were the years of the life of Sarah. Why, why add that? You know, it, it already says, uh, these were the, this is the lifespan, and then these were the years. He says that adds something. For it might appear that Sarah sinned by shortening her lifespan. Had she not taken the binding of Isaac so much to heart, she would have lived longer. And we all know that suicide, of course, and I think, not I think, uh, it seems to me clear that what he's saying here is, and I do not know of anyone else, as far as I know, no one else has ever said anything like this, that Sarah committed suicide, suicide to teach God that suffering might have some value some redemptive value, some purging value, but when it is excessive, then you end up with brokenness. Um, and so the Torah, by adding those years, the, Rab, the Rebbe actually picks up on where that Midrash uh, leaves off with the sinless years. And he says, even those years she would have lived another few years, are also sinless, meaning she would have been considered a sinner if she commits suicide, because she did it for the sake of Israel, for the sake of Israel. These were the years of life, meaning all the years of Sarah's life were equally good, including the years that she would have lived beyond 127. So this is, this is fascinating, and it's something, obviously, that he's feeling. He thought before he gave this sermon, before he experienced personally this kind of loss, that sin um, has value. Sin has redemptive value. Sin cleanses. Sin purifies. But he understands that this, uh, uh, sorry, not sin, suffering. Sorry, scratch that. Suffering purifies. But having gone through this, he knows that this is just devastating. This just breaks a person down um, and has no value whatsoever. And so she did this. She actually gave up her life intentionally to teach God. And this is something that um, draws on Hasidic theology. It's kind of startling in a way to think, you know, teaching God. But this is very, very um, teaching God or that God learns from human beings or that human beings affect God. This is very deep rooted in Kabbalistic literature, in Hasidic theology, but this sermon takes it to a different level. That is, in a sense, God kind of lives in an ivory castle, one could say, right? In an ivory castle, um, he needs to be jarred every once in a while and look at what's going on down here. So in theory, suffering is imposed, um, you know, for purifying reasons, but, you know, get out of your ivory tower and the only and look at actually what you're doing. Look at actually the effects of this. And um, there's no greater shock uh, to, to jar God out of his ivory tower than my death, meaning for Sarah to actually have uh, intentionally given up her life to prove this point, to prove this point. And this is, like I said, the first sermon he gives after uh, his own son was um, died as a result of that initial bombing. Again, if there's any questions. Um, um, here's another uh, corrective note. Um, I'm just turning to another sermon, uh, which shows you uh, how bad the situation um, has developed when he's doing these corrections. Um, in a sermon, uh, which is quite late, towards the end of the sermons, uh, June 27th, 1942, which is about a month, Parshat Chukat, which is about a month uh, before the sermons end, he says, uh, you can read this in Hebrew, but he says, uh, uh, historically, children, our children have borne the brunt of anti-Semitic oppression. Um, and so, again, like that other sermon, this is 
no different than those other uh, oppressions, those other kind of crises that we've gone through. Children are always the ones that bear the greatest brunt of the suffering. And then he has here a note. Lahashlim emirts Hashem hachaserkan. This is, there's something missing here, he says himself, to be completed later. And this is what he completes later. We're not quite sure when, but after the sermon's end, this is a, a picture of the correction and the insertion. And this is um, what he has that's inserted. The children's suffering surpasses anything Jews had previously experienced. Oi me hayalanu, what has become of us? This is very, very similar to that corrective note. It's not uh, an explicit theological corrective, but it is a historical corrective that feeds into that theological, what Thakenheim would call a novum, a brand new kind of event that we've never experienced before, that though we've experienced this and children have experienced this kind of oppression, uh, what we've been through, this kind of suffering on the children surpasses anything we've previously experienced. Uh, uh, this, by the way, the note here, once again, is a note that signals to any future readers or editors that the correction and the original is to remain. That is what he wrote here, insert, to be completed later to insert is to remain. Um, and here's one, I, th I think I'm, I'm not gonna, um, you know, take up that much more time. Um, I want to um, talk about uh, another sermon, which is this one, again, very close to the end. And this is picking up on uh, something you may recall, uh, or something you recall we do every, uh, in the High Holy Days, Yom Kippur, there is a central uh, prayer. Uh, it's also a midrash. Uh, it's it's uh, uh, well, well recorded in the Midrashic tradition in various forms of the Ten Martyrs, the Ten Martyrs tradition, those Asara Haruge Malchut, the Ten um, you know, rabbis who were tortured and uh, killed by Hadrian, uh, the Roman emperor. The most famous of them is, of course, Rabbi Akiva, you know, whose flesh was literally uh, torn off him. Uh, as he was tortured. This is what um, the, um, the original Midrash um, said. That is the original Midrash in the prayer, actually, we have it, uh, that is the angels, the angels started to scream and cry and complain to God as these 10 martyrs, this is in the original Midrash, were being tortured. And the angels themselves, are depicted as not being able to take this anymore. And they, they accuse God, um, or it's kind of accusatory tone, this is Torah, and this is its reward. As they're seeing all these various tortures that, that are explicitly kind of described in that prayer. Um, and so God tells them, and th this is the original, the original Midrash, God says, if I hear one more sound to the angels, I shall turn the world into water, or I shall turn the world, world back to its original state of chaos. That's, a, that's a, another version of the Midrash, of tohu and bohu. And now this is, so, so this is, that's the original. This is what the Rebbe now says. He turns this Midrash back at God. Now that innocent, angelic, pure children, again, the children, as well as great Jewish saints, that's again the indiscriminate devastation, who are even greater than angels, are being killed and slaughtered only because they are Jews, are filling the entire space of the world with these screams. And this is a question mark. And the world has not reverted to water, continues to exist as if nothing has affected to it. What the Rebbe is doing is he's actually taking that Midrash and throwing it back at God in, in the attempt, by the way, these sermons are also not just, um, not just 
kind of um, trying to have his community, addressing his community and uh, kind of spiritually tempering his community, spiritually advising them, trying to help them cope. They, I think each and every one of them are also kind of what we call theurgic, are meant to impact on God himself. The way he interpreted, for instance, that Midrash about Sarah is not just meant to, uh, to address his audience, but it's meant to address God. It's meant to impact on God turning verses back on God. Here he turns this Midrash back on God. God himself there says, I can't take any more screams. And if you scream, meaning to the angels, if you scream every lo any longer and hurl this accusation to me that, um, you know, Torah, it seems that these martyrs, I mean, they're, they're great Torah scholars and they're not rewarded, in fact, quite the opposite, that that's, tr that's a truism and uh, that's true. And God says, don't, don't, don't say anymore, because you'll force me to actually destroy the world. So uh, the Rebbe is saying, now that, that screams are not just coming from angels, screams are, are enveloping the entire world, and, and the world does not slip back into chaos, does not revert to, to water, the floods aren't coming streaming in, that means you're just standing by apathetic apathetic to what's going on. Um, so, um, so that's another sermon where he kind of turns back uh, a midrash, just like, a, just like those verses, back on God, trying to impact on God uh, to change his ways, to change the ways of imposition of suffering. So I, I want to I just um, end because... Um, um, the time is uh, wearing on. And uh, as I said last time, I'm very wary with my students of Zoom fatigue. <laughs> so um, there are, cap there are uh, other um, diaries that kind of uh, are in sync with um, the Rebbe's sermons from a historical point of view. You can kind of cor correlate things that are happening in the sermons with things that are happening in other diaries. One of them is a famous one that was left by um, Chaim Kaplan a man named Chaim Kaplan, um, and all he's worried about is his diary. Just like the Rebbe is uh, furiously revising and editing, just like um, all those people in the Oynik Shabbos archives are recording and writing and drawing while they're starving to death, um, the importance of leaving a record in whatever way Chaim Kaplan from a historical point of view, the Rebbe from a theological point of view, um, is just overwhelming. Uh, and this is what he says. This is July 30th of 1942. That coincides with the very, almost the very last sermon because the great deportations have started. And this is the seventh day of the deportations, what they call the gross action. Living funerals pass before the windows of my apartment. Cattle trucks, or coal wagons full of candidates for expulsion and exile carrying small bundles under their arms. Their cries, remember what the Rebbe just said about children, children's cries just taking up the entire space of the world. Their cries and shrieks and wails which rent the very heavens. Very, very similar, but he's not, Chaim Kaplan is not doing it from a religious perspective, but he's describing the very same phenomena that moves the Rebbe to um, confront it in his way, and that moves Chaim Kaplan to confront it as a, a, a historian with a diary, filled the whole area with noise. Now they've stopped because they're deporting everybody. I'm skipping some because um, there's much more that we could talk about. Perhaps next year, there'll be part two uh, of these lectures. But I just want to go to another uh, note that is almost precisely in line with the Rebbe's last sermon in uh, mid-July of 1942, again, when the great deportations start. So the head of the Warsaw Ghetto, who I mentioned before, uh, the picture is not that great here, but uh, Adam Chernyakov, this is a picture of him in, in his Jewish council office. Um, kept a diary as well. 
And there's virtually a, a notation, uh, not really a great diary in terms of, but very, very short and concise. Every day, almost every day has a notation. I talked to this Nazi officer and he commanded me to do X. Or I tried to negotiate with the SS um, to do this uh, for his community. But when the deportations start, uh, what they demand of him is unbearable because at this point in July of 1942, uh, what they're telling him is you need to deliver us a product. The product is human beings. Every day you need to, de to deliver us six to 7,000 people that are going to be deported. And there's no discrimination. That is, you can't choose, right? Who will live and who will die. You need to just give us 7,000 and it doesn't matter. And so we know that Chernyakov tries to negotiate with them as if he has any negotiating power and said, say, can you, can you spare the children? There are children that uh, don't have parents anymore. They're in an orphanage. Uh, please uh, let me deport others, but not the children. And they say, uh, you know, no way. And so he actually, the day that he, he uh, needs to come up with that amount of people to be deported, including children, he commits suicide that day. And there's a last note that apparently he sent to the uh, uh, people that were close to him. They are demanding that I kill, once again, the children, the same children that the Rebbe is talking about, the same children that Chaim Kaplan is talking about. But here in his own situation, they are demanding that I kill the children of my people with my own hands. There is nothing for me to do but die, but die. And he actually commits suicide. And so I want to end with just this slide here, which is um, really captures, again, um, something that you see crossed out. This is, again, the Rebbe's handwriting, and it is his signature. It is his signature. And so the signature says the following. Um, which is his own uh, name and his heritage, meaning his, his father's name. So it's Colonimus Kalmish, uh, Colonimus Kalmish, Ben, the son of Harav HaKodesh Morenu, the holy, our holy teacher, Harav Elimelech, meaning that was his father's name, Elimelech, Zecher Tzadik, the Kadosh, may, uh, uh, the, uh, the memory of a sainted and sacred one uh, for the eternal life, may his memory be for eternal life, me Grudzisk, from the town of Grudzisk. That is, his father um, was a Rebbe in a small town that was close by in, in Poland, close to Warsaw, called Grudzisk. Now, there is this that's crossed out. Uh, until recently, we didn't know what was crossed out here, but when this scholar that I told you about that published the, uh, the new edition, um, used some technology to see through, um, you know, the the um, the the layer of crossings out. This is what was there. Av Beitin Po Bepiasetsna. The way he would usually sign his name in his official capacity as the head of the rabbinical court here in Piasetsna, in that town of Piasetsna. The reason he crosses it out because there is no longer any rabbinical court. There is no longer any community in Piasetsna. There's no longer any community whatsoever. So this is a very, very uh, poignant kind of uh, uh, picture that really um, you know, uh, tells uh, 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 the story of what happened with the Warsaw Ghetto, which is consummate destruction. So I just want to end uh, off with, go back to the Oinik Shabbos archives, those archives um, that these sermons were buried with. And so uh, the one, one of the people who was commissioned by Emanuel Ringelblum to bury this material, including these sermons, was a young man named David Graeber, age 19, who was killed uh, soon after. So once the deportations begin, they know uh, time is um, time is running fast, um, and so uh, 
Emmanuel Rigamum uh, gives the order to bury the archives. They're buried August 3rd, 1942. These are his really last words that he appends as a note to the material that's buried. What we were unable to cry and shriek out to the world, we buried in the ground. I would love to see the moment in which the great treasure will be dug up and scream the truth at the world. The same way Chaim Kaplan would have loved his to see his diary, the same way the Rebbe would have loved to see the publication of his works. Uh, the same way that uh, that uh, Chernyakov would have loved to see children survive. So the world may know all. So the ones who did not live through it may be glad and we may feel like veterans with medals on our chest. May the treasure, which includes the treasure of the Rebbe sermons fall into good hands and may it last into better times, may it alarm and alert the world. And so I would say that um, these sermons, um, it, it's almost a sacred obligation for people to be aware of all of these sermons and all this material, um, exactly the way this uh, David Graeber um, proclaimed that may it last, may it alarm, and may it alert. The only way that these sermons and all this other uh, material can last and can alarm and can alert is for them to be known and for them to be read. So um, I'm going to stop there. Um, and uh, I'm perfectly willing to uh, take questions, uh, anything that's clarify things or comments. Um, or questions. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Diamond. I yes. just wonder uh, if you saw Steven Spielberg's uh, sister, Nancy Spielberg, made the movie. It's called Who Will Tell a Story? And it has to do with uh, how they did this and how they finally found the whole treasure. There's only one that is not, it's under the Chinese embassy somewhere yeah. in, uh, I, I didn't know if, uh, it, you know, it was well known, but yeah. it was a very, very wonderful, well, it, it's very horrible, but uh, their uh, plight and uh, how they preserved all of the archives. And I'm happy that this is also part of that. Right, so I, I, I actually spoke about this, uh, uh, mentioned it last I didn't week. hear it last, yeah. sorry. Yeah, so. yeah, so I, I did, sorry. yeah, so I, I did mention that and I did mention the uh, the book that that the documentary is based on. Um, and um, uh, I've seen it. Uh, yeah, I, I did too, yeah. Yeah, and um, you know, I urge people to also read the book by the Samuel Kassow, K-A-S-S-O-W. Uh, it's called Who Will Write Our History, the same, the uh, but, same but, uh, but what you say is actually um, not quite right. I don't mean that is it, it's not well known. It's, it's not anywhere nearly as well known as it should um, be, as, as it should be. And by the way, until a few years ago, not known at all, really, in the wider um, I know. world, um, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising was known by everybody. And that's a problem that we have. That is, th this is not at all to belittle the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, uh, not at all. But what we tend to do, and, and this is, I think, a, um, a, a problem with uh, uh, Hollywood, a problem with the way we've been influenced, is that we only consider armed resistance resistance. And so this has been really, really ignored. Um, this is, this we're talking is, about, we're yeah. talking about 35,000 uh, pages of yeah. documents, yeah. Um, not just these sermons, um, that oh, have been virtually ignored. Everything that was going on in the Warsaw Ghetto, right. they, you know, they sorted in milk cans. Right. Right. And, and after the war, of, of Warsaw was devastated. Right. And right. Uh, only one person among them survived. And right. she's standing there and she said, I know the treasure that's underneath right. here. Right. And uh, I don't know if I'll ever get that. Yeah. So I spoke about, yeah, there were actually three. Three people that survived. I, I, uh, but I she was one, yeah. she was Ruchel, Ruchel Orbach was the one exactly. that they, they uh, focused on in the yeah exactly. So yeah, um, I'm sorry that I no no problem no problem at all yeah. Uh, anyone else that uh... well yeah Marjorie yeah yeah I just uh, I put it in the comments but listening to your account of these sermons, I just recently reread Camus' The Plague. Oh yeah. And there are two 
Catholic, the Catholic priest Panalu delivers two sermons, the second one after he witnesses the horrific death of a child from the plague. And you watch him going through contortions to try to still maintain his faith right. against what he has just seen. It would be interesting to juxtapose the two, you probably tell a lot about comparative theology. Yeah, yeah no, that's a good point. And of course, the, the plague has become a bestseller again yes. <laughs> after, after a lot of years. But that's a, that's a very good point. Obvi of course, uh, you know, the, this cuts across traditions. You know, it, it, you know, um, you know, Christians uh, all in the tradition of also deal theologically with suffering. Um, you know, uh, this is a, a the the problem is the same, but the tools right that the Rebbe has the rabbinic tradition is different. Of course, the, yes. the textual uh, tradition is different. But th that's a very good point. That I'll have to go back and, and take a look at that. Um, yeah, yeah, and see. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Anyone? Uh, Anyone else? So is, is this where, because um, I've been actually studying and I'm on a journey of reading his work in, in English and studying yeah. with, with um, a rabbi, also the works then, that are being translated. So it, Derech HaMelech, these aren't the Derech HaMelech, right? No, no, no. So um, you mentioned, like I mentioned some other writings. So there is, uh, I actually... I actually have that right here. <laughs> so uh, what, what you mentioned, Derech HaMelech, yeah, those are a collection also of sermons before the war, before uh, the war. That's so the, the, I'm studying now for, on the Torah portions. Okay, but, very good, very good, right. So, so this, this cuts across, this uh, cuts he across. Mentions, but he's mentioning in Derech HaMelech, he's mentioning the, he, it's just the beginning, but they're before the war, you know, there's some things that he's mentioning. That so, right. So, Deborah, as I said before, um, when I mentioned one of his other pre-war writings, it's not like things were hunky-dory before the war, right? So before the war, it's pretty bad. Like, I, I think before the war, you couldn't imagine greater suffering. I, I mean, the, the poverty, uh, you know, that, that between the wars, between the First and Second World War, uh, of Jewish communities were just just uh, unimaginable poverty, suffering, um, oppression, and so he's dealing also with suffering uh, very often in those uh, particular sermons that are, uh, like I said, in in this. Um, uh, and and so, but but in in the sermons given in the Warsaw Ghetto, it reaches a different level. It reaches a yeah, different obviously, level. Obviously, yeah. uh, yeah. that I guess it consumes. It's consuming right. at that level, right? right? The right. war and everything is consuming. That's right. That's right. Right. And keep on studying them. They're very. Yeah, very and I'm also them. studying the in English the Jewish spiritual book. I don't know what the Hebrew is. It's um, it's just his meditations and visualizations. Oh, okay. and, All right. Good. Good. Uh, Paul. Yes. Thank you. W wonderful to talk. Thank you very much. My attention was drawn. Uh, uh, to the uh, uh, an alternative uh, uh, answer or an approach to an answer to this uh, terrible suffering. Uh, th those are the writings of uh, Viktor Frankl, and he developed yeah. his logotherapy right. and found some meaning. Uh, the the, uh, the man's search for meaning. So he has he has a different uh, outcome, but still, it's his efforts to deal with this. On, incredible amount of suffering just yeah. the same way that the uh, rabbi shapiro was was uh, was uh, dealing with absolutely uh, so th these yeah absolutely paul th these are very different but but dealing with the same kind of issues him him from his kind of psychological with his training uh right. you know uh through that's that's his tool of trade uh, the yeah. Rebbe is dealing it with rabbinic literature and that's his tool of trade uh you know camus is dealing it from a philosophical uh, standpoint, uh, although that's a that's a novel, but it's a novel uh, written by philosopher. Philosophers don't usually write great novels, but um, but that that you know that that that's that. So I th I think you're quite right. It, it's it's actually a good exercise um, to read these things kind of together in a way um, and see how uh, different you know different perspectives, um, each one dealing really from the depths, depths of their being, 
uh, with with the with the kind of material that they know best. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Anyone? Anyone else? All right, good. I so, just feel compelled oh. to say what I've just what oh. I've just read most recently is that it was just sort of to to bring Abraham because that's where we are in the parshas. You know, he's talking about how Abraham's life was. It, it, he, he, people were were worshiping idols, and the world was burning. And then he talks about his life, about the the life of and how these two lives. Right. Just right. amazing. His. Right. But I mean, that's what happens. They, they, they view the world through the lens of, you know, through the lens of the Bible and, and of course, the Talmud and, and the Midrashic tradition. Yeah. Okay. I guess we'll, um, we'll get, end there. So um, I want to say thank you. Um, first and foremost, to uh, Professor Diamond for, uh, for joining us last week and this week. Um, and for sharing this material that is um, uh, in some ways, right, you know, very, very pain inducing um, because we, we know the tragedy that, that came of it, even as apparent as it was to, to the author himself, um, but uh, also uh, uplifting in a way because um, we've been able to be on the other side of it and uh, see the resumption of Jewish life um, in a way that probably was, was, only a, a glimmer of hope um, for, for all those who were, um, you know, in the experience of the Shoah. Um, and while it's certainly not the same level of tragedy, what it is that we're living through today, um, I think there's an interesting question of uh, if we 75, 80 years from now, go back and look at the, the writing and the work, um, the drashot and the social media posts and whatever else um, that our spiritual leaders um, have been uh, crafting over these last eight months and, and who knows how many more to come. Um, what, what, uh, what might we be able to learn and extract from them um, looking at them uh, in retrospect, which by the way is something I, I, whenever we're on the other side of this, I encourage all of us to do um, without waiting an extended period of time, um, but taking a look back and, and seeing, seeing what's going on. Um, a quick personal anecdote to share. My, my grandfather was a congregational rabbi and, and wrote out all of his sermons and um, we have scanned digital copies of them. And on occasion, um, I sometimes go back and look at the sermons of the Shabbatot that immediately follow major historical events, um, whether it was uh, the Kennedy assassination oh, yeah. or the fall of the Berlin Wall or the Challenger explosion or, or whatever it happened to have been um, to, to get a lens into what were people, um, what was he at least um, thinking about and saying to his congregation in the moment of these taking place. And of course it, it bears um, mentioning that uh, today is the second anniversary on the English calendar of the uh, horrible tragic shooting of the tree of life in the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. Um, and I've been seeing things all day of people um, sharing their thoughts of what these last two years have been for them, recalling how where they were and how they felt two years ago that Shabbat morning when, when they heard the news. Um, and so we're, we're doing a version of this exercise ourselves um, even with this, uh, the anniversary that we're commemorating today. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you all so much for joining us. I encourage you to check out um, our website, www.beth-sedek.org for um, more programming. I do. Uh, I will mention two specific things that are starting next week. Rabbi Wernick's Talmud class begins next Monday evening, uh, November the 2nd. And Rabbi Friar Bodzin will be teaching on Wednesdays during the day, I think it's at 12.30, um, a four-part class on the book of Job. Um, so if, if you're, you're still looking for things that are going to be a little bit, uh, downtrodden, um, you, you have the opportunity to continue that, continue that learning through the month of November, um, and plenty, plenty of other things going on as well. Um, so, uh, so with that, uh, I, I see that Deborah has a comment or a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, was, was last week's, uh, lecture, um, recorded? Can I access it on the website? So we're, it was recorded. We're going to put both last week and this week's recordings up uh, tomorrow or Thursday, Thursday at the latest. I, I was otherwise, I really, really wanted to be there. So they'll be, they'll be on the Beth Sedek YouTube really channel. really interested me. So you'll find them on the YouTube channel um, and you can, you can share them with others as well. Um, Professor Diamond, thank you again. It's a pleasure to have you back teaching for us at Beth Sedek and we look forward to a return engagement sometime soon. Excellent. Um, and thank you all for joining us and I wish everybody a pleasant rest of your evening. Um, thank you. Bye-bye. Be well Thanks and stay safe. Coming.
Thank you. Night. Good night. Thank you, Professor Dyer. Thank you.